Hey everyone, this week we've got our presentation video. So that's why I'm showing up here first on the camera. I wanna give a little explanation. It's a pretty long video. So if you're not interested in watching the whole thing, I'm gonna put links down in the description below, kind of a table of contents for where we talk about different things throughout the presentation. So you can check out maybe just the parts that you're interested in. Uh, if you have any questions on things, please feel free to leave a comment down below. We'll do our best to answer those questions for you. And uh, wanna send a huge thank you out to both my grandma for organizing this event and everyone in Pacific region for coming out and packing the room again. Kind of makes us feel like rock stars, which is nice. <laughs> uh, and hopefully when we finish up our circumnavigation, we can come back and do our final third presentation. So thanks for watching everyone and uh, see you next week. And the stars of our evening tonight are Amy and David, my grandson and his wife. How long have you been married now? Seven years now. Seven years? Yeah. Okay. okay. Seven years. <laughs> Is that right? That's how I ended up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, three years ago, almost to today, uh, David and Amy came and talked in this same room to those of are For any of you here, do you remember? Oh my oh gosh, my goodness. this is interesting. Okay, so you've got quite an audience of people who remember. And so a lot of them have asked me from time to time, how are they been doing? And of course, they don't have to ask, I just tell them to. <laughs> but anyway, they are here visiting for just, they came in last night and they're leaving tomorrow afternoon. So this was really the one night. A whirlwind, we could do yeah. A whirlwind. Just flew in, well, as so many of you know, from Tonga, from Tonga to Fiji, from Fiji to LA, and then LA to up here. So they've been on the move. Wow. So and they just arrived last night. So maybe Amy did get a little nap. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> anyway, but you're here to hear them. So uh, this is part two, and I think um, you will enjoy it. You're welcome to ask questions. I think there's. You're saving that for the yeah, end. Yeah, so we have a slide for questions at the end. So if you don't mind, just if you've got one that's absolutely urgent, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll answer it during it. But if you save it to the end, that yeah. way we'll, we'll get yeah. them all at one time. So. And if you have trouble hearing, would you put your hand up? We didn't get a microphone, so um, we want you all to be able to hear. But they have a video going, too. So without any more ado, Amy and Dave, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Arlene. Thank you. Well, so first of all, I just want to say thank you guys so much for coming back here and listening to us again. Uh, Amy and I love to say that, you know, this is like our first fan base here. It's the first time we gave a presentation and everyone's come back to listen to us, which is pretty fantastic. Um, as my grandma was saying, this is part two, and I just want it known at the beginning, we're not all the way around the world yet. We are halfway. So the boat is right now in Tonga, and uh, for those of you who haven't heard the story, we tried to fly out on Tuesday, but there was some rain, and apparently a little bit of rain is enough in Tonga to cancel all the flights. <laughs> so we had to rearrange our schedule, so we appreciate everyone being flexible and coming today, um, but we are really glad to have you guys here. So I'll go ahead and we'll get started. Yep. So first of all, who are we? Kind of good to start out with. No. Oh. Well, I don't know. This is probably through this. Is this on? It yeah. works by itself. Yeah. Well, yeah. the red, red button. light on. Red button. Show it. Yeah. Oh, it's green now. Try it again. Okay. Okay. Can people hear me? Yeah. Hello, hello. That's better. Okay. Um, you can help us. I don't know if, is my natural voice okay or is anyone still having trouble hearing me? Okay. That's a little higher? Okay. Um, I'll just try to shout because I'm not sure the stereo is on for this thing. But um, So to start out, my name's David. I'm the grandson of Arlene Alton and this is my lovely wife, Amy. Um, this picture is actually from us in La Rochelle, France, which is right when our boat got launched. It was built in La Rochelle. Um, so we've been now living on the boat for three, two and a half years, two and a half years, oh, full time. Wow. So we sold everything. Um, Amy had a, a business that she ran and we sold all that and bought the boat and now we've been living on it. So anything else to add on who we are? I think that's good. All right. That's it. 
<laughs> so, what was part one? It's got a lot of hands here, people who were here, which is absolutely fantastic. But for those of you who weren't here, we'll give just a quick little recap. At that point, the boat hadn't even been built yet. So we were just planning everything. And even at that point, there was a lot of stuff to plan. So um, that is a very flat picture of the globe, and we're planning on going all the way around it. So um, let's see here. For those of you who can see, France is up there, which is where we started from. And Tonga is right about down here somewhere. Oh my God. So we've come a long ways around. Now, how did we get started? Everyone always wants to know the answer to that question. This right here is me on their sailboat. <clears throat> and you can kind of see my hands on the wheel, but I'm pretty sure my grandpa was over there making sure I didn't hit anything. So um, I, that was about the extent of my sailing experience until I met this one. Um, and I'll let you give your family history in, in sailing. Sure, so my family's been in boats since the 1950s. Sorry? Mike's not Mike. on. I don't think it's yeah. a spot Okay. Uh, so my family's been in the boat business since the 1950s. My grandfather had a company doing oil vessel supply rigs. Um, and my father also started his own boat business as well. So while I wasn't quite a sailor, I was definitely around boats quite a bit. Oh, I heard it now. Yeah. Hello. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. Yay, that's exciting news. Okay, did everyone get the basics of the how we got started? Okay, well then we'll use this for the rest of the presentation. Hopefully we'll, we'll be a little louder. So, at, like I said, at that point our boat wasn't even built yet. So this was all just kind of theoretical and we had been on a sister ship at a boat show. But this is actually Starry Horizons, which is what we named the boat. And this is her in Canada. Um, so, but at that point, she was basically just a dream. We had hoped that they were working on her for us, but we had no real guarantee that she was being built. Okay, so here's a rough idea of what we anticipated for our route. We were planning on leaving La Rochelle, France, sailing across the Atlantic, spending some time in the Caribbean before we went through the Panama Canal, and then across the South Pacific, spending some time in Australia before heading over to cross the southern route of the Indian Ocean and then sail up through the Atlantic Ocean. All right, so that's what we covered last time we were here. Now we've actually gotten into our adventure, so we'll tell you all about that. So we figured we would start out by giving a few more details about our boat herself. So as you can see, she's got two hulls, which means she's a catamaran. Um, and we like that a lot because it means we don't live like this. Yeah. <clears throat> she's much flatter to sail. Um, she is 44 feet long, so she's actually a pretty big boat. And it is usually just Amy and myself on the boat. Um, so it's plenty of space for the two of us. And I really like the fact that if I'm doing something wrong, there's a whole other side of the boat I can disappear to. <laughs> so this is the layout of our boat. She's a three cabin version. You can see here on the right side of the boat, the starboard side, that we have basically a, a master suite here. This is our bed. Here's our head or bathroom. Up on the top, we have our main salon where we have a um, dining room table, and then this is our galley here. And we have two guest cabins, one on the stern and one on the bow of the port, uh, port hull. And we have two guest heads as well. So our guests are very comfortable when they come to visit us. This is the main salon, so this is the upper portion of the boat. Yeah, this is actually our boat. Um, so we, we cleaned it up and took some nice pictures for you guys. Um, so we've got our dining room table here. This is um, mostly food storage. So this is a refrigerator here, and this is our pantry. Over here, you can see my freezer and the galley here. 
beautiful. Okay, uh, over here we have a nap station, and so you can see we have a laptop set up here, but you can sit here and look at all of these instruments that are right here, and you can also see out the front of the windows of the boat, so you have a very good visibility for when you're on watch. This is another shot, so you can see a bit more of my galley. We've got the oven here and the stove and a better shot of the nap table. So this is down looking at our cabin. So you're looking at the back end of the boat and that's, it's pretty much a queen size bed. Um, so it is a lot of space. It's one of the reasons we really like the catamaran so that we've got <laughs> plenty of room to walk around the sides of the bed. We don't have to cl climb over each other in the middle of the night if we have to get up and do something. So that definitely helps a little bit of marital harmony. Um, then you can see right here, we've got a little couch right there. And I'll be completely honest with every one of you, that usually ends up being laundry storage. We don't really sit down there all that often. <laughs> And then this is looking forward, so you can still see the couch right there. Uh -huh. And we have a little desk where we can sit down and um, work on our laptops or do something like that. And looking forward into the bathroom, also known as the head. So um, we actually have like a walk-in shower um, that's partitioned off, so it prevents the rest of the boat from getting wet. Um, it's, it, I mean, it's pretty much like a small apartment. It really is kind of what we were looking for in terms of just having a very comfortable life while we're on the boat. Okay, so this is actually the outside of the boat. This is the area that we call the cockpit. So when you walk out of our galley towards the aft of the boat, this is what you're seeing. This is our main dining table. So most of the time when we're eating a meal, we are eating outside. We have a full enclosure here. So we can zip everything up and keep us pretty dry on the inside. Uh, it's not perfect. If a wa wave splashes us, we will get salt water in the boat, and we often are quite covered and salty by the end of the passage. But um, we love having this big, beautiful view around us. Gorgeous. And this is one of my favorite spots on the boat. This is the helm. So. Uh, you can see we've got all of our electronic instruments right here. So this is our chart plotter with our GPS. We can see um, if there are any other boats around us, drive the boat, control the engines, all the lines for the sails. So raising up the mainsail, playing with the Genoa, for all those who know those terms. Um, that's all done right here. And again, as you can see, it's completely enclosed which means that it, it can be pouring down rain and we can stay pretty dry. So all of our friends who are out there soaked to the bone, not loving life, and we're just sitting there with our little cup of hot chocolate and sailing on across the world. So it, uh, it's a very nice and comfortable space to be. But I don't think it's our favorite spot on the boat. <laughs> So this is the next step up, the very top of the boat. This is what we call our lounge deck. And at about mm, five o'clock at night, when it starts to cool off a little bit and the sun's starting to set and there's a lot of color in the sky, this is where you'll find us, hopefully with a cocktail in hand, just kind of enjoying life. That time of night is called sundowners and it's kind of a worldwide cruising phenomenon. Everybody's up at five o'clock and checking out the sunset. So this is a picture of Starry Horizons on the back of the truck that delivered her from the factory in La Rochelle, France to the water. And the factory is about 15 miles inland, so they actually have to spend a couple hours delivering the boat from the factory to the water. And I've actually put together a little video that we took because my parents came over to France and drove the chase car behind this setup all the way to the water. So. We're going to go ahead and play that for you. If the volume is not loud enough, please raise your hand and I will turn up the volume of the video.
that yellow van had to basically act as the eyes in the back to drive from side to side to make sure he wasn't going to hit anything. We hadn't officially paid for it at this point, so I was uh, a little nervous. <laughs> So that was a pretty exciting day, getting a chance to, to watch that in France. But that was literally the very, very beginning of Starry Horizons. So um, hope you enjoyed that, and we'll get a move on to where we've actually been. Okay, so as we said, our plan was to leave La Rochelle, France when we launched. Um, we did actually leave pretty quickly, and we sailed across the Atlantic to Miami. So we spent uh, about three days sailing to Spain, and then a week sailing to the Canary Islands, and then 26 days sailing across to Miami, which is the longest passage we'll ever have to do, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> we spent five months in Florida outfitting our boat. We added a whole bunch of equipment, which we'll go over. And then from Florida, we went to the Bahamas for about three weeks, and then it got to be hurricane season. We thought, okay, we need to either be like north of Georgia or Bermuda or um, go very far south. So we looked at our options and we said, you know what, let's go north. Nobody ever goes up to Canada, so let's go up to Nova Scotia. Um, we spent six weeks in Nova Scotia and then we went over to Maine. Uh, we spent about a month in Maine and then we came down to Bermuda and then to the Caribbean. We arrived in the British Virgin Islands and we spent 90 days sailing the Caribbean chain. From Granada, we went to the Panama Canal and through the canal, and then we have made it, um, it's a very standard route called the Coconut Milk Run, through the Galapagos to French Polynesia, Niue, Tonga, Fiji, and then we just spent cyclone season in New Zealand, and now we've come back up to Tonga. Wow. Wow. <coughs> So all told, we've sailed almost 22,000 miles in the last two and a half years, and that is a lot in that amount of time. So we've, we've been moving pretty quickly, I'd say. Wow. So um, one of the things that is really interesting for me is all the kind of essential gear that's needed on a sailboat in order to be able to sail anywhere in the world. So one of the most important things is we have a water maker on the boat and you don't really see when you sit here you don't really think about this but if you don't have the ability to make fresh water out of salt then you have to either severely ration how much water you use or find some place to fill up all the time 
And believe me when I say the infrastructure of some of these countries we've gone to, you're not going to be able to find a place to go in and fill up on water. So this actually will take in salt water and will make 30 gallons of fresh water an hour, which is quite a lot actually. But I figured that in the interest of marital harmony, being able to have fresh water showers after we go swimming or you know drinking water whenever we want is rather important. So having a large capacity water maker was definitely an important thing for us. Wow. How is it fueled? So um, I'll touch on that in just a second. <laughs> okay, so then of course everybody always asks, well, what do you have for safety gear on board? And this is just a small selection of things that we have. Up on the left-hand side, you can see what's called a deck vest. And in this case, it's an inflatable harness. Uh, we wear it when we have to go out on the deck um, whenever we're on passage. And if we were to fall overboard, it would inflate. It's got a light on it. It's got like a hood. It's very bright. Um, and hopefully we'd be rescued. In that deck vest, we also have what's called a personal AIS beacon. And that device would be triggered when our deck vest inflates and it sends a signal to any AIS system um, in the area. And the AIS is automatic identification system. So that's our best chance of being rescued if we fell overboard. Our boat would be able to see where we are and any other boat in the area would be able to see where we are. Uh, the second device here is called an in-reach spot tracker. And this little device pings out to satellites wherever and actually shows up on our website. So on our website, there's a place called Our Location, and it updates when we're on passage every hour and sometimes even uh, more often, and shows people where we are from anywhere in the world. This is our VHS, VHF radio. And this is the most standard piece of equipment we have on the boat for safety. Every single boat, you know, in a, in a decent size has one of these, and we can use it to communicate with any boat within line of sight. Uh, down here, this is a picture of what's called a drogue, and the drogue is a very long line of rope, and it has a bunch of tiny parachutes sewn in. So if we were ever in a situation where there's a storm, and despite the fact that we have all of our sails furled in, we are still going too fast, we would deploy this off the back of the boat. We would tie it on and drag all these little parachutes behind us, and we would greatly decrease our speed. We also have something called a sea anchor, which is almost exactly what it sounds like. It's this giant parachute. You throw it out in your bow in the middle of the water, and the, the water actually fills the parachute up and stops you from moving forward very much. We've never had to use any of these devices, and hopefully we will never will. And we'll get to sell our boat with brand new drug and sea anchor. <laughs> this is a EPIRB, and in an emergency situation where we really desperately needed rescue, we would set this off. Um, other boats cannot see it, but the Coast Guard gets a signal. Anywhere in the world, the Coast Guard will um, deploy rescue services and try to find us. And the last thing, and the one we use most frequently, this is our anchor here. It's an 85 pound anchor. It's called the Mantis, and it's actually um, the company is down in Houston where we're from. Um, we sleep very soundly at night because we have a fantastic anchor. So one of the biggest issues a lot of boats have is that they're anchored at night, but maybe the wind picks up or maybe the bottom quality isn't all that good and they start to literally blow away and drag their anchor away. Mm -hmm. That can be a huge problem. Mm -hmm. But we have a fantastic anchor setup, and we sleep very soundly at night and we've hardly ever had any issues with our anchor. All right, so um, related to the question earlier about powering the water maker, on the right we have a generator on the boat, and it's a very big one. It could probably power a small city, um, but we use that to use, it powers the water maker. We can run the air conditioning on the boats with it. We can charge our batteries. Um, that, so that is run with diesel, and it we don't use it all that often, pretty much just to make water, but it's nice to have a big backup just in case we need it. Um, what we primarily use is solar panels, and pretty much all of these dark spots that you can see on the top of the boat here, those are solar panels. So we have over a thousand watts worth of solar panels on our boat, which is a lot. 
Um, but it does a really good job of keeping our batteries charged up. It lets us use our laptops while we're out at sea. It will keep all of our electronics powered, all the GPS, the autopilot, which is very important. Um, so we do everything we can to try to be sustainable and not run and use our diesel as little as possible. So those are our two primary sources of power generation. And so far, it's keep, kept us uh, pretty well in power, I'd say. How many kilowatts is that generator? 12, which is 12 kilowatts for a boat of our size is pretty massive. We should probably have about six. But that was installed by the manufacturer, so I didn't get to choose that one. I like that this <laughs> All right, so this is another very important, almost daily piece of equipment on our boat. This is our dinghy, and um, her name is Little Dipper. And a dinghy is to a boat like a car is to a house. So we bring Starry Horizons into port, we drop our anchor, and then how do we get to shore? We take the dinghy. Uh, we probably spend, I think, about 80% of our days on anchor as opposed to being in a marina. So it is really, really important to have a good dinghy. She has a 15 horsepower engine and um, is 12 feet long? 10 feet. 10 feet long, 10 feet long dinghy. So we've pushed it, we've had six people in her before, and she handles it all right, but um, for just the two of us, it's pretty great. And of course, you know, we want to be comfortable when we're out on the boat. Um, we have quite a few nice amenities. As I mentioned, we do have air conditioning on the boat. We don't really run them because we can open up all the hatches and get some nice airflow through the boat, but if it's just too incredibly hot, we will use them. Um, I, I will admit, I insisted upon this television, but now that I'm here and see this one, I might steal this one and take it with us. Um, so, you know, we'll usually, after dinner, we'll sit down and maybe watch a TV show together or something like that, so that's always enjoyable. And because neither of us really like to smell all that much, we have a laundry machine on the boat, so we can actually do laundry. Um, and believe it or not, as long as we don't run the dryer, the solar panels will keep up with doing a load of wash. So we usually just wait for a nice sunny day when the solar panels are putting out a lot of power, right. and then this, we can run a load of wash. And, and then we line dry. And then we line dry, yes. Yeah. So some days you'll see all of our unmentionables just out on the lifelines drying, <laughs> but everyone else is doing it too, so. <clears throat> and um, we do a pretty decent job of trying to document our trip. So we have a blog, which Amy is primarily responsible for, um, but we have a lot of cameras to capture everything. So um, we have a drone. I'm guessing most of you have at least heard of those in the news, but I love to fly the drone and get views of our boat while she's out sailing in the middle of the ocean. It is just fantastic. Um, we have a video camera, which is in the upper right there, and I should have made this little disclaimer earlier. We have a YouTube channel and my camera is recording right there, so make sure everyone's on your best behavior. <laughs> when we go underwater swimming, we have a waterproof camera called the GoPro, and we'll take that down with us to try to capture all the coral and the fish that we see. And then we also have a, a pretty decent um, digital camera to be able to take still photos and stuff like that. So Amy's really been the one who's been getting into that camera recently. But as you can tell, we have a lot of photography equipment on board. So that's you know, also pretty essential. Do you have any crew members? We pretty much sailed just the two of us. So uh, we've had my brother has joined us for one passage, but other than that, pretty much every single mile has been just the two of us. Um, so another question we get asked quite a lot is how do we communicate while we're at sea? And uh, to be honest, it is a little bit difficult because you're not going to be plugged into your Wi-Fi internet and streaming Netflix or anything like that. What we have is a satellite phone, and it uh, will connect all the way up into the satellite ne network up in the air, beam it back down, and we can do basically text emails. So we'll be able to send an email. Um, we actually have basically uh, commandeered my sister, who acts as we call her our landlocked morale officer, who while we are at sea will send us emails just oh. making sure you know the world is still moving, any news, comments people are leaving on our blog or Facebook page. So that is, is very important for morale while we're out and about. 
Um, but the other thing that's really important for us while we're at sea is to get weather updates. So um, this last passage was a great example. So while we were sailing up to Tonga, when we started out, the weather was great. It was from behind us. But as I was watching and downloading weather, thanks to our satellite phone, I could see that the wind was going to keep clocking around and start to come from in front of us. So what we were able to do was change our plan while we were sailing. Instead of keeping on a straight line, we actually curved quite a lot in order to be able to keep the wind at a good angle and not have an uncomfortable sail. So being able to get that weather updates with our satellite phone, very important. Um, most uh, everything will operate on direct current. However, we have a few systems that are run directly off the generator, like the water maker, that's AC. And we also have an inverter on the boat. So that will actually convert DC from our batteries to AC so that we can run our laptops and stuff like that. So she's, she's got a little bit of everything. <laughs> All right, so like we said, most of the time it's just the two of us on passage. That is pretty shorthanded. Most of the people we meet have two or more people on board or they take on additional crew for passages. But for us, we found that it works pretty well, just the two of us. So the average day out at sea, I make dinner and we usually eat around six o'clock. By seven o'clock at night, David goes to bed and I go and watch. And I am up at the helm, reading, listening to music, doing whatever it is that I can do to keep myself awake until about two o'clock when David gets up and he takes over. So I've just had a seven hour shift. David takes over at two, and as kind as he is, he lets me sleep in as much as I can. Um, the first day it's only until about seven, and then the second day it's until like noon, and then it starts to kind of even out. So usually I'm up around 10 o'clock, so I've gotten about seven hours of sleep, or um, eight hours of sleep, and he's been on watch for about eight hours. He's already had breakfast, so I have some breakfast, and then he goes down below and takes a nap. And when he gets up, we have lunch together. And then I go down below and take a nap. And I wake up at 5 o'clock to start dinner, and then we do the whole day all over again. <laughs> so after about the third or fourth day, things start to get a little bit more comfortable. Um, I do get a little seasick, but it's not so much that I'm incapacitated. So I'm just kind of not 100%. Um, but after the third or fourth day, it starts to get a lot better. Um, we both get a little bit more energy. We don't necessarily need naps during the day anymore. And that's nice because then we start to get to spend time together as well. As you can imagine, if one of us is always on watch and the other one's always sleeping, we never see each other. Um, so I think the passages have all gone pretty well for us in terms of being able to be out at sea for a long time. Um, we have a lot of cruising friends that say, well, I would rather do an eight-day passage than a three-day passage. Because by the end of the three days, you're just getting settled in. But the days four through eight are actually pretty great. So life at anchor, my favorite part. <laughs> um, basically, cruising has been described as fixing your boat in exotic locations. And I'm here to tell you there is some serious truth in that. <clears throat> this is in one of our engine compartments. And as you can tell, I am doing what we call boat yoga trying to fit as best I can in very small spaces, which I am not always successful at. But um, there is always something to fix if I so desire. We have a, a list of things. They're prioritized, so I know that if something really important breaks, then I need to fix it immediately. If something not so important breaks, well then I'll see how I'm feeling that day, whether or not I want to cram myself in the engine room. Um, so there is definitely some fixing the boats and you know getting parts and stuff like that can be a bit challenging, which is another reason we were especially glad to be back in Seattle. My poor grandmother devoted a, an entire shower to all the boxes that we had shipped to her of boat, <laughs> boat parts that we're going to be taking back with us. Um, so that is, is nice to be able to shop over here for those things. But it's not all bad while we're at anchor. We get a chance to literally step off the back of the boat and go swimming with exotic fish. There's coral all around us. Um, you know, we'll have some sharks that might go swimming by every once in a while. I mean, it's you imagine just kind of a tropical aquarium, and it's literally off of our back step. So it is, it's pretty phenomenal. I have to be honest. Okay. <laughs> well, we figured what we do right now is share a couple of our favorite stories for while we've been out on the boat. This picture 
It's a little tough to see, but there are dolphins that are jumping up in front of the boat with us. Oh. And we get that actually quite frequently, is dolphins will come up and join us in the middle of the ocean, which I feel is fair because we're probably the only thing for hundreds of miles around that they have to play with. But my favorite story of all is actually our very first night out on the boat. Right after we left La Rochelle, France, Amy was a bit nervous about taking her first night watch. So I'd stayed up late with her, we made sure the boat was, like, the sails were all set, everything was good to go. And finally she said, okay, I think I'm comfortable, go ahead and go down and get some sleep. So I went down below, I showered, I had just barely fallen asleep, when all of a sudden I hear this, David, David, come up here, David, get up here now! And I am freaking out. <laughs> like, did we hit something? Are we sinking? We've owned the boat for literally less than a day. How is this happening? <laughs> and of course, the boat's so new that I can't figure out how to get the door open to get out of our cabin. <laughs> so, not so good. My heart is racing, and I get up to the helm, and Amy is like, Look, there's dolphins in the water, and there's bioluminescence trailing behind them. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so what was a terrifying moment actually ended up being pretty good, but uh, my hands did stop shaking for a little while. Uh, so we've learned since that point that unless there is an emergency, dolphins at night, we let the other person sleep. <laughs> Wow. All right, and here's one of my favorite moments for the past two and a half years. Um, this is Paul, and I'm actually, this, this picture in the background is an island in French Polynesia called Huahini. And Paul lives not on Huahini proper, but on one of the barrier islands um, just off of it. So we met Paul, we anchored, and it's like this gorgeous anchorage, one of the most beautiful ones we've ever been to. And Paul paddles up to us in his little um, outrigger canoe. And it takes us a little while to figure it out, but Paul is deaf. And Paul doesn't speak English, he doesn't speak Polynesian, he doesn't speak French, he doesn't speak pretty much any known language. But in his little outrigger, he has a waterproof case. And he pulls that waterproof case out and he shows us his guest book. And all the books that come to this little motu sign his guest book. So we get out our pen, we get out one of our boat cards and sign the little guest book. And um, through pantomimes, he tells us that we're welcome to come ashore and he'd like to show us around. And then he pulls out three green coconuts that are our, his gift to us. So we have these fantastic coconuts. One of them was like the best coconut I've ever had in my life. It was very good. So the next day I go to shore and Paul meets me there and he walks me around his entire motu. It takes like two hours. And through drawing in the sand or using hand gestures, he's telling me about how he watches for ships and then he gets in his canoe and he paddles out to meet everyone and help them get through the reef. And he shows me how his island is formed. And as we walk along, I'm picking up shells and he gets me a coconut and holds them for me and he picks flowers for me. And later that day, he paddles out to our boat again and he gives us papayas. So it's just an amazing experience with a local. He's so generous, um, and you know clearly he lives in a part of the world where people are not as fortunate as we are. Um, it's like very few, very little running water. They're collecting rainwater. Um, his house is very small, but he's an extremely generous person. So it's one of my best moments that I've had with a local. We were so lucky to get to meet someone like Paul. All right, so. Now we have put together a few little collections of our favorite photos. This is me, and this is our first fish that we caught. And it was so exciting because this was just off of Canada. So we've been cruising for, um, well, we've been on the boat for like seven months, I think, and we haven't caught anything. With all the miles we sailed across the Atlantic, we hadn't caught a single fish. So this is actually the biggest tuna we've caught the entire wow. time we've been cruising. This is an albacore tuna, and it probably weighed about 20 pounds, and I was so, so excited. Uh, we are not very good fishermen. We haven't caught all that many fish, but this still is my favorite one. So <clears throat> we love the stars, as evidenced by the fact that we named our boat Starry Horizons. 
This is in an island in the Caribbean called Dominica. And it just so happened that the night was absolutely calm. There was absolutely no wind. There was no waves out in the anchorage. So all the boats stayed still long enough for us to get this picture of the stars. Wow. And it's a little tough to see. She's kind of small, but that starry horizon's right where my finger is. So it was just a complete and total, I would say lucky. I don't know what I'm doing. So this was a, a pretty fortunate photograph just to capture the stars with all the boats oh, in the anchorage. Yeah, and you know, great. this was just another country where it's, it's a very poor country. Um, again, same sort of issues with running water and you know, electricity for all the houses and everything. But we met some locals that were just so friendly and we took on some tours around the islands and they, they just love to be able to show and express their culture with you, which is just fascinating to be able to get out and learn something different about all these different places that we've been to. So this is using the drone and we are in the Panama Canal here. Mm -hmm. And that was, this was kind of the pinnacle moment for me that I had had my eye on for a long time, just to go through the Panama Canal that you've always heard, this you know, great wonder of the world coming through the Panama Canal. And it was both amazing and a bit of a letdown because it's so slow. You come in and you just wait. And then the water slowly comes up and then you slowly go forward and they do it all again. But at the same time, you're sitting there and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm in the Panama Canal. And it was, it was a really fun experience. Um, we had some friends of ours that came down to Panama to join us to do this. So we got to share the experience with them. Um, it took us two days in total because they start you in the evening, as you can see. This is the first set of locks on the Atlantic side. And then once you're done with this, you anchor in Gatun Lake overnight. And then the next day you have to motor about 50 miles to get to the next set of locks which then take you down into the pacific so it was you know a bit of a, a long wow. couple days to get this done but it's a lot easier than going around south america mm -hmm. yeah. say that for sure. <laughs> so the way this worked was you can see starry horizons is right here we've got a monohull or we like to call them a half boat and then this is a tug and they were the ones tied to the wall and then both of our boats were basically tied to the tug so we didn't have to act act actively manage lines and everything so it was pretty easy honestly for us to just come in tie up to the boats come up and then keep moving so how much do they charge you for going to the locks it's big um our fee was about fifteen hundred dollars to go through the Panama now fifteen hundred And this is the end of that second day. This is our first night in the Pacific Ocean outside of Panama City. Oh. <laughs> All right, and uh, this little guy is in the Galapagos Islands. And it's really adorable, but it's quite a problem. Uh, as you can imagine, they are not properly toilet trained. <laughs> so we woke up um, our first morning in the Galapagos to find this guy on our trampoline and the mess that he left behind. Uh, we had kind of tried to block off the stern of the boat to keep him from getting on board, but he got over that, as did he probably the same one the next morning. And then um, the third morning, I woke up at about two o'clock in the morning and heard some banging around and so I got up in the middle of the night and chased the sea lion off of our trampoline. Before he made a mess, it was great. <laughs> we did eventually get our fenders and our blockage set up enough so that the sea lions couldn't come on board. So I absolutely love this picture. Yeah. This is again taken from the drone and this is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. There is no land around us for hundreds of miles in this picture. And I really think this shows what it's like being out in the middle of the ocean. It is just blue as far as the eye can see. Um, and oh, yeah. this was, I mean, I don't really know what else more to say about that, but it's, it's really, it's an amazing feeling just knowing that you're out in the middle of nowhere and you have to be self-reliant. Like if something happens, we have to be able to figure out like how to fix it or how to do something. Um, you know, we had a few issues with our Atlantic crossing. Some things broke. You know, can't just walk down to the store and buy something. So we had to figure out 
what to do in the middle of the ocean. But I just I love this picture. It really gives a sense to me of what it's like out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. What is your cruising speed? I love those questions. Um, I have a spreadsheet that I have kept for every single mile we've been on passage. And we have so far averaged 6.79 knots over all those. So it's about 160 miles a day. Oh, Victoria. What's your so, speed? Uh, we've gotten her up to about 11 on uh, just sailing without surfing down the waves, but that's right about on the edge of being a little overpowered. So we, when we're out in the ocean, we generally sail pretty deeply reefed just to be a little more comfortable and well within safety ranges. So. Um, this picture is from the top of the highest mountain in Fiji. And this is my friend Kyle who came out to fly and visit us. And there's a couple reasons I included this picture. Is number one, we really love it when friends of ours come to visit. Um, it's a long ways to come out to the middle of the South Pacific. So we appreciate them making the effort. But we really love sharing the experiences that we've had. And this particular one was kind of epic. Uh, we decided to use Google Maps to tell us how to drive to this location. Google Maps in Fiji, not very reliable. <laughs> we spent about four hours, four and, a half hours. four and a half hours trying to drive to this mountain on a dirt road that was more boulders than dirt. And uh, by the time we got to this mountain, it was two hours to climb, is that correct? Uh, Two hours and 15 minutes each way. Yeah, two hours and 15 minutes up and two hours and 15 minutes down. Oh. And then we had another four and a half hour drive back. So it was a long day of travel. Yeah. But it was, it was a phenomenal day. So the Fijian rugby team climbs this mountain as part of training. So it was, it was definitely a memorable experience to, to be that high up in Fiji and, and make it happen. The rental car? Oh, yeah. And we think we broke the rental car because it started making some funny noises after that. So. <laughs> it had a rough day. <laughs> yeah. Ever have any problems with pirates? No. We have had no pirate issues, mostly because we avoid areas where pirates are, thankfully. So, uh, this picture is taken in Hakatika, New Zealand, and these are glowworms. So this is the Hakatika glowworm dome. It is quite the tourist attraction. There's a lot of people there. But with good reason. There are, um, you can see, it's absolutely stunning. It looks like stars. It's really, really fascinating. So a quick little information about this picture. Last year when we were in Tonga, they have a swim with the humpback whales. And a lot of the humpback whales make their way up to Tonga to actually give birth. And then we'll hang around Tonga for a little while until the babies get strong. And so we got a chance to go out and swim with the humpback whales. and. This shot was literally from me to Amy, was as close as this humpback whale was to me. It was just the most incredible experience. I swear he was looking me right in the eye, and I was like, please don't squish me like a bug. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is, Tonga is the only country in the world that allows this sort of swimming with the whale. So, I mean, it was literally a once in a lifetime experience being able to get out and go do this, which was just phenomenal. Um, so, to wrap things up, um, I had put together some clips of some of our favorite experiences that we've had out on the boat. So I'm going to play a little video for you, and then once we're done with that, we'll open things up for questions. Since Starry Horizons was launched on October 29, 2014, we have visited 19 countries, sailed over 18,000 nautical miles, crossed two oceans, and met more good people, and created more good memories than we can possibly count. It's been an amazing adventure, far beyond anything we could have dreamed of, and hopefully you'll indulge us as we take a look back at some of our favorite moments along the way.
So with that, we'll open it up for questions. What's her being? She's 23 feet wide. So she's a pretty big girl. Well, how many miles did you travel that you didn't use the sail? Um, not a lot. So the question was, how many miles have we traveled that we didn't use the sails? And unless the winds are maybe like four or five knots, which is really light and pretty rare, we'll try to sail. Um, so I would say only maybe a couple hundred miles where there was no wind that we've had to just straight out motor. So is the is, is your sails all uh, totally mechanical? So it takes no physical hand, handicap on you, physical work on you to uh, handle your sails. Yeah. So the we have one electric winch which we use to raise the mainsail because that's really heavy. But the, the forward head sails, we have a manual winch. So we'll winch those in by hand and whatnot. So it's a combination of electric and manual. Um, and I heard a question asking where this picture was, and I'm sorry I missed it. But um, this is the Huahini in French Polynesia. This is when Amy was talking about Paul's Motu. That's the Motu over on the right hand side that she was talking about. She so, lived over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you run into any real storms along the way? <laughs> Uh, we have been incredibly fortunate in that we have not really run into any storms while we've been on the boat. Um, we have had some fairly high winds, maybe about in the 30s um, a couple times, and maybe low 40s maybe once. But in general, as I said, when we're watching the weather, we can kind of tell that it's coming at us, uh -huh. and we can prepare the boat. So we usually reef our sails really deeply if we need to and kind of prepare in advance. Mm -hmm. but if we can see that there's a storm coming along the path that we want to sail, we just wait. I mean, if you're in a place like this, why leave, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> this is a very up-to-date presentation. To how many audiences have you made this presentation? <laughs> you guys are the first, so hopefully this was a good time. <laughs> 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 There must be a book in your future. <laughs> yeah. Is there? Yeah, I'm sure. We'll let the writer answer this one. Uh, so I write our blog, and I try to update it at least once a week. Um, I've looked at writing for magazines, but I would much rather publish our own material on our blog. Uh, so I have not done any of that yet. And maybe, um, maybe a written book in our future. I think most definitely a coffee table picture book in our future. I think that would be good. <laughs> you had a question? Did we already get you? Yeah, go for it. Where is your boat snoozing now? Uh, Starry Horizons is in Niafu, Tonga. Sorry. It's called Niafu, Tonga. So uh, Tonga is a small uh, kingdom. It's actually, it's never been colonized. It's um, <coughs> A thousand miles northeast of New Zealand and uh, it's broken into four different island groups we are in the second from the north island group um, it is the second largest city in Tonga but that's not really saying anything at all um, it's a very protected harbor it's been described as going on like a river cruise when you come up the harbor it's very flat very calm and that's why we left her there um, we did talk about staying in New Zealand while we make this trip, but um, we wanted to get back to the boat and start cruising right away. So as soon as we get back there, hopefully we will take off for adventures. Wow. Yes. Is it safe? In being, Tonga? Being there no. by itself? Yes, we have a friend looking after her, so <laughs> she's good. She's definitely safe on the mooring and, um, you know, despite its um, poverty, Crime is pretty low in Tonga. So. Yes? In many uh, adventures into nowhere, there's someone uh, riding alongside in case something happens. Uh, but you have nothing except your own uh, surveillance? Right, so for the most part, we are by ourselves, um, especially on long passages. Now. That's uh, not to say that we're entirely alone out there. Um, there are often boats, 
um, especially as we've done the coconut milk run last year, there are probably at least, um, I would say like 200 or 300 boats that are generally headed in all the same direction. Um, almost everyone leaves the uh, Central Americas at roughly the same time and gets to New Zealand at roughly the same time and makes the same stops along the way. So in that sense, we have seen some boats when we've been out sailing that maybe we'd never met before. Um, we have seen the same people over and over again, which is great. Um, in the passage to Tonga that we just did, we had two other boats, friends of ours, that left the same day. So they were headed to Fiji, and one of them is faster than us and one of them is slower than us. So while they weren't near enough to offer help, we did keep in touch with them via email. And so we gave each other position report updates and just kind of general information, and they would have been able to go for help if needed and get more detailed information out to our rescuers if needed. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Where do you go from Tonga? Ah, excellent question. We didn't cover that one. So uh, when we got to New Zealand, we decided that we loved the South Pacific so much and we'd done it so fast that we wanted to spend another year in the South Pacific. So from Tonga, we'll cruise, we'll cruise in Tonga for probably about two months and then we're going to head up to Fiji again and hopefully spend a couple months in Fiji before we hit possibly New Caledonia and Vanuatu before going to Australia for cyclone season. Um, that's another very popular stop. We'll have to be south of Brisbane for a cyclone season. And then our plan is to cruise up the east coast of Australia. And in about July, we will leave Australia for Indonesia. Sail through Indonesia, probably stop in Singapore, Malaysia, and then go to Thailand. And the time to leave Thailand is roughly January. So we're looking at January of 2019 now. We'll cross the northern Indian Ocean route, going to Sri Lanka, Maldives, Seychelles, wow. down, sorry? No? Okay. Um, down to Madagascar, and then to South Africa, and everybody spends cyclone season in South Africa, and then leaves roughly January again for the Atlantic, and you head north. So our goal is to finish our circumnavigation in the Caribbean in 2020. That, that will have been roughly six years on the boat. Yes. How, how did you decide to have the boat may, um, manufactured in France? So, uh, Starry Horizons is a Fontaine Pajot boat. That's the manufacturer of the boat. And uh, she is a fairly mass produced boat. I think the third largest production catamaran in the world. Um, the factory's there, and really, when we were looking at catamarans, we did all of our research online and kind of looked at the specifications and the statistics of the boat, and we said, well, there's some that we don't like for this reason and that reason, and so we had a short list, and we went to the Annapolis Boat Show, and we actually got on most of these boats that we were looking at, and it's kind of like looking at a house, you know, you walk in and think, um, yeah, I really like this layout, and this feels good. Like, I can picture myself living here, all right. So that's, that's how we picked Starry Horizons. Yeah. It's an excellent topic, and we get tons of questions on it. <laughs> Other questions, yes? You're gonna be traveling in some pretty unfriendly waters at times. How do you feel you protect yourself? You armed <laughs> uh, which waters in particular are you referring to? I'm wondering which which pictures, which uh, destinations you think are. Okay, uh, so there are two piracy hotspots. Um, one of the hotspots is in the Philippines in Southeast Asia, and one of the spots is basically along the Suez Canal in the Middle East. Um, both those spots, even though piracy itself has declined, it is still, especially in the Suez Canal area, it is still a political, politically unstable area. Um, we plan on avoiding those two areas. Most of the time, there are other cruising boats nearby, so um, it is quite a good community. We don't have any firearms on board. Um, it, it, there's a lot of discussion on that, as you can imagine. 
the general consensus is that when you clear into foreign countries, oftentimes they will confiscate your firearms. And when you get them back, they may or may not have been fired. Um, so that is a very big risk and one we're not willing to take. So we don't have firearms. We do have flare guns, which people often use to defend themselves if needed. And we have um, wasp spray on board, which can deter people. Um, most of the time, the most common piracy is really theft, and that is actually worse in the Caribbean than probably anywhere else in the world. Uh, we lock our boat frequently. We lock our boat at night uh, when we're asleep. Um, we, yeah, we don't leave anything out, no valuables out. Um, we do know that you know our boat's pretty nice and it could make us a target, but we've been pretty lucky and haven't had any issues so far. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Who's next? Yeah. Yes? So what part uh -huh. of the journey did you acquire your drone? Ah, I'll let you talk about that. <laughs> One of my favorite <laughs> topics. <laughs> and how much fun did you have wearing your <laughs> so that's a bit of a two-part question. Um, we got our drone while we were in St. Lucia in the Caribbean, and we actually had a friend bring it to uh, bring it with her to us, um, which you may have seen in the highlight video, a uh, drone shot in downtown Halifax. That was actually a friend of ours who came out to meet us in Halifax and took such an awesome picture that it actually convinced this one to let me get a drone, so I was very thankful for that. <laughs> Um, I actually had like a little miniature toy that I practiced with in Houston before we left. And I wasn't very good with it. I used to hit the walls and terrorize our dogs mostly. Uh, but truthfully, the one that we have is pretty much foolproof. So it's pretty easy to fly and makes it pretty easy. It took me a little while to gain the confidence to fly it off the boat while we're sailing. Because I can't like tell it to return to a spot because we've moved past that spot. So I have to basically fly it up to the boat and maintain speed and then kind of slowly bring it over the boat and Amy will catch it. So I have to be very careful I don't cut her or I'll be in a lot of trouble. No, no. <laughs> so we did a few things. When we first started out, we were attending some weather courses, actually, um, from like kind of weather gurus who could teach us a little bit about the weather and what we should be looking for. And then our first several big passages, we actually hired a weather routing company that would give us information and send us data on what they're seeing in the weather. And at the same time, I was downloading the weather so that I could see kind of what they were talking about and what they were looking at. So kind of those two combinations has given me at least enough confidence that I feel we can get from point A to point B without damaging ourselves too much. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Thank well, you. We will be here for a while. Thank you guys so much for coming.